On January 25th, the Japan Society of Northern California hosted its annual Japan Outlook program, focusing on hot topics for the upcoming year in Japan and U.S.-Japan relations. The event featured two distinguished speakers, Akio Fuji, a seasoned journalist and foreign policy expert, and Tobias Harris, an authority on Japanese domestic politics. Thank, uh, welcome, everyone. And uh, we, we do this every year uh, to, to look at trends in the coming year. And um, uh, this year, we decided because uh, there's so much uh, happening um, around uh, the world, and in particular in Asia, in the area of, of politics and political developments, um, that we are, uh, in, in particular, we have um, we have elections in, uh, of course, in the United States, but there's also elections taking place, uh, legislative elections in Korea that are very important. We just had the Taiwan elections, um, and uh, we had Indonesian general elections, the general election in India. So a big year uh, for elections around around the world, in particular in Asia, countries that are important to the U.S. and Japan. Uh, so we wanted to look at kind of domestic political developments, and and there is also an election coming up in Japan that people probably don't know that much about what is very important, which is the election for the LDP presidency in, in the fall that will determine the, the next prime minister or, the, or whether Kishida-san will continue. So there's, a, again, a lot of things happening. So we're looking at how domestic politics are shaping policy, both in Japan and the United States, and also how that then uh, impacts on foreign policy, in particular looking at uh, economic policy and U.S.-Japan economic relations. So that's the that's the topic for the today. We've got two great speakers uh, to address that, that topic. Um, first is Akio Fuji. Uh, Akio is the chair of the editorial board of the Nikkei Shinbun. I think many people here may know him, or know certainly of him. He's a veteran journalist. Uh, next year will mark his 40th year at the Nikkei. I didn't even realize that journalists lived that long, given their lifestyle. But uh, <laughs> he's been doing this for a very long time. He's uh, served all over the world. He's got two stints in uh, Washington, D.C., um, in the bureau there. Uh, he was head of global news uh, and is, uh, is a very much an established expert in the area of uh, Japanese economic relations uh, and U.S.-Japan relations. Our second speaker is Tobias Harris. Uh, he is the deputy managing director of the Indo-Pacific program at the German Marshall Fund. Um, he is a regular commentator on uh, Japanese domestic politics, and it has actually been uh, done a program for us at the Japan Society as well. Um, and he is the author of the Iconicist, uh, the, uh, the uh, sorry, the Iconoclast, uh, which is a book about the late Prime Minister Abe. He, he actually wrote it before um, Abe, Mr. Abe passed. Um, and is uh, probably this uh, the, uh, well is a seminal work on on the uh, life and career and political importance of uh, Prime Minister Abe. Uh, so, without further ado, let me just turn to our first speaker to uh, to start off our discussion. Akio. Yes. Oh, okay. So, oh, thank you very much, Larry, and thank you very much for inviting me here today. Um, as Larry uh, mentioned, uh, this year is said to be a year of election worldwide. And for Japan, there are three important elections. Uh, the first is Taiwan's ele presidential elections. The results were announced on January 13. The second is South Korea's parliamentary election in April. And third, Needless to say, is a U.S. presidential election in November. The Taiwan presidential election was won as expected by uh, DPP, uh, Democratic Progress Party Vice President Lai Chen-te. Also, Lai, who is close to the United States, expected to maintain the status quo for the time being. There are points of interest, such as China's reaction to the May 20 inauguration and who the U.S. will send the inauguration ceremony. But we expect that the U.S.-China will try to avoid major tension at least this year as a presidential election approaches. Second, uh, South Korea parliamentary election. This is important for President Yoon's future domestic political leadership. 
The UN administration has been promoting improved relationship with Japan and also trilateral cooperation among Japan, the US, and the South Korea. And it will be interesting to see how the outcome of this domestic election will affect the uh, diplomatic front. And uh, third, the US presidential election, the biggest issue for Japan's foreign official this year is who will be the next US president, how to respond to him or her. A senior Japanese foreign minister official told me recently that the biggest challenge for Japanese diplomacy this year is a US presidential election. That means how to deal with another Trump presidency. Uh, the term Moshitora is now popular in Japanese media. This is Japanese contraction of if Trump wins. Now many policy makers and business people are preparing for the possibility of another Trump administration next year. Recently, the term Hobotora has also appeared. That means almost Trump win based on the recent primary election results. So biggest mission for Japanese embassy in Washington is also focused on how to access and build contacts in the event of Trump administrations. So the first thing that is likely to happen when Trump administration is born is on the diplomatic front, probably reduction of support for Ukraine, withdrawal from the international cooperation, and revival of bilateral deal-making, trans transactional diplomacy. There, there, there are concerns about the security of East Asia, including the Taiwan issue, and what will happen to the Japan-US defense cooperation. In particular, at the previous Trump administration, had the generals and adults in the administration who took programmatic, pragmatic policy such as General Mattis and McMaster. But uh, the, such people will no longer be in the second Trump administration that's a big source of concern. If Trump prefers to deal with powerful leaders such as Putin, Xi Jinping, and Kim Jong-un, there is risk that leaders will make unpredictable, unpredictable agreement with each other. And also, Trump's dislike of NATO is well known. And they are warning that he will discuss withdrawing from NATO and reviewing the US military presence in Japan. This would have major impact on the balance of power in the Asian region. So that's a big concern for us. On the economic front, uh, there are also concerns about the proposed termination of MFN, most favors nation treatment for trade with China and possibility of uniformly raising tariff on Japan, Europe, and other countries. The IPEF, Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, which was established by Biden administration, that's economic cooperation framework in the Asian Pacific region, is also likely to be suspended. And the withdrawal from the Paris Agreement and the suspension of support for electric vehicle also will have major impact for Japan and the global economy. Um, Japan is credited with having handled the previous Trump administration relatively well. This was largely due to the personal strengths of late Prime Minister Shinzo Abe. Mr. Abe famously met with Trump at Trump Tower in New York 
immediately after the 2016 election and quickly established a personal relationship of trust. Trump also made various unreasonable demands on Japan and others' allies. But in the end, he agreed to turn down or compromise if Shinzo said so. Now, we longer, no longer have Shinzo Abe. How will Japan respond to this? That's a big challenge. Uh, one, is to, one is to establish a framework that will not waver even there is a change of administration. For example, the first Japan US, Japan US Korea trilateral summit meeting was held at Camp David last year. And this meeting should be made a regular event to establish a stable framework that will continue regardless of change of the government in three countries. The other is how to uh, deal with Trump administration is uh, the Trump administration took office. Mr. Uh, last time, Mr. Trump announced his withdrawal from TPP, Trans-Pacific Partnership, Asian-wide Free Trade Agreement, uh, as he promised in the campaign. Then Japan took, the, took over the negotiation and led the way to concluding the TPP as a CPTPP without the US. This time, uh, Japan may need to show more leadership if the Trump administration comes to power and stops pursuing a uh, course of international cooperation. Uh, the Biden, uh, even the Biden administration fighting it difficult to return to CPTPP because now FTA is a very dirty word in Washington. So instead, the Biden administration created the IPEF as a new framework for U.S. involvement in Asian economy. Uh, probably Mr. Trump will destroy this framework created by the Biden administration. And so uh, next key question is uh, if Japan should save the IPF again in, uh, instead of the United States leadership. But uh, I think this IPF is important. In particular, it's including supply chain management to cope with economic security change. And I think there is no objection from the Republican side on this cooperation. So I hope if Trump was elected, uh, keep this framework uh, stable. But also in Japan side, big problem is uh, a political scandal in Japan. And uh, frankly, it is difficult to foresee who will be the Japanese prime minister as of November at the time of the US presidential election. So that is why the efforts of Japanese diplomats and bureaucrats have become so important this year. And also relationship with China is uh, very important for Japan. Uh, last November, Prime Minister Kishida met with President Xi Jinping and re reaffirmed the strategic mutually beneficial relationship between two countries. But still, we have a lot of pending issue, including the problem as traded water from the Fukushima nuclear power plant and the detention of Japanese businessmen in China. But uh, I think we need a dialogue, continued dialogue or in bilateral uh, dialogue with China, not only government channel, but also various private level. And uh, finally, and um, I would like to make an emphasis, Japan needs should take a leadership in this fragmented world, especially in the economic cooperation, uh, especially in the trade and uh, economic framework, multilateral framework, uh, such as IMF, WTO, and uh, other uh, ASEAN, uh, ASEAN plus three, APEC. And uh, recently, uh, Japan has also expressed interest in new 
trade agreement with Latin America countries. So it is to take important uh, leadership role in broadly expand uh, free trade uh, agreement agreement in globally. Uh, uh, I would like to, uh, that's my first remarks. I'll Great. stop here. Thank you very much, Dr. You really covered a lot of ground there. We can dig down into some of those issues in the discussion. Uh, you had uh, Akio had mentioned the uh, the, uh, the the scandals and the political situation, uh, unstable situation in Tokyo right now, and that's a good segue into what uh, Tobias I think is going to talk about. So uh, please, Tobias. Thank you uh, to the um, the Japan Society of Northern California. I've done these uh, year ahead uh, in for the your, your sister organization in DC. Uh, I think it's a great exercise. Personally, I always like doing it because it really forces me to to look, you know, to try to look ahead, to uh, look through the veil and, and really try to think about where things are going. Um, so really thank you for having me. Um, and and also I, I'm doing this from Tokyo where I'm, I'm here for uh, a 10 day trip. So I've, I've already heard uh, quite a, quite a, uh, some good, some good bits of Intel. Um, and uh, really thank you to uh, uh, Fujisan for um, showing uh, really why the domestic uh, situation in Japan has such important consequences that really, uh, given the uncertainties of the international situation, um, a stable Japan, a Japan that's able to exercise leadership uh, is incredibly important. Um, but the scandal, uh, the for lack of a better term so far, maybe the, the LDP kickback scandal um, really could have some far reaching uh, consequences as far as Japan's leadership and, and the stability of its politics. Um, so um really the new year has gotten off to a dramatic start i mean even setting aside the uh, earthquake in ishikawa prefecture and and the um air collision incident um i mean the the politically the most uh, significant developments is in the last you know the last week or two uh, we've now seen the ldp's largest faction the abe faction has announced that it will dissolve the prime minister's own faction the kichita faction has announced that it will dissolve uh, the Nikai faction, which is smaller, but um, is still is headed by this still influential uh, Mr. Nikai, the former LDP Secretary General, will dissolve. And we've also heard the uh, Moriyama faction, the smallest faction of the party, uh, will also dissolve. Um, so you have, in a very short time, some venerable institutions, some very powerful institutions, uh, have decided that they are going to bow out as a result of uh, the scandal that emerged in uh, late 2023. That uh, the Abe faction and, and other factions had uh, basically skimmed funds off of uh, from fundraising parties and passed it to members and did not document those accordingly. There have been indictments. Um, and so this is a uh, profoundly uh, chaotic situation, um, complicated by the fact that two large factions, uh, the Aso faction and the Motegi faction, are resisting pressure to join this wave of dissolution. Um, so you, you have this sort of half faction, half non-faction situation, and it's not unclear how that's going to resolve. Um, and the LDP is debating political reform, and we saw a first draft this week of what that could look like, but it's unclear just how far reaching and how significant that will be. And so, I mean, this is a, a profoundly uh, unsettled situation. It raises a lot of questions about, um, well, Kishida himself, but also uh, the future of LDP governance and uh, the LDP's uh, ability to stay in power. Um, so just starting with LDP internal governments, uh, so ostensibly you have uh, a political reform headquarters that has said that it wants to decouple uh, campaign finance and fundraising and personnel decisions from the factions, but will allow the factions to continue, um, which makes room for the Aso and Motegi factions to hang around. Um, this is, uh, I think a deeply unsatisfying uh, solution so far. And um, I think you're now left in this situation where it's unclear um, well, how exactly the functions that the factions will play, uh, have played, will, will be played in the future. I mean, so factions have uh, contributed to recruiting LDP candidates. They've, of course, raised money. Uh, they've done career development and, and of course, uh, promoted their own members and tried to get them into government jobs. Uh, and of course, as we saw in 2021, they're still incredibly important when it comes to choosing the LDP's leaders. So you take out the factions, uh, all of these functions that the party you know, that they fulfilled within the party um, become 
open questions. And in theory, I think the, the solution is gonna be centralizing more power in the LDP Secretary General, uh, but there's been, I think, resistance to over-centralization within the party and that resistance is likely to continue. So you're gonna have conflict now over party governments. Uh, and, and it does, I think, suggest that the factions have um, above all else, maybe been a useful uh, check on the power, on this sort of centralizing process, this process that has seen, seen more power in the hands of the prime minister in the hands of the LDP secretary general. And the factions have been sort of a source of restraint. And so the question is, are you gonna continue to have that? Um, it seems like there's a demand within the party for something that can serve as a, as a restraint. Um, so that that's gonna be a source of, uh, of tension going forward. Um, the, I mean, I think related to that, then there's the question of just how meaningful uh, this effort to push the factions out of LDP uh, rule is gonna end up being. I mean, we saw this in the nineties where when the LDP went into opposition in 1993, they said, well, we're not gonna have factions anymore. They're gonna be policy groups. Um, and a few years later, everyone dropped the pretense that these were anything but still factions. And so uh, it seems entirely likely that we could see, you know, in, in a short period of time um, that the factions reemerge in some form. Uh, more practically, uh, there, there's a few, I think, practical consequences that we have to consider. Um, first, I think right now you're looking at a massive power vacuum within the LDP. Uh, you know, the Abe faction is the largest faction. Uh, it had a number of leaders, uh, aspiring leaders who wanted to uh, pursue the leadership of the party and also certainly were in just sort of the senior ranks of the party would hold uh, important jobs in the party leadership and in the cabinet. And in a stroke, basically those leaders are uh, out of the running for senior leadership positions. There's talk that they might even have to leave the LDP and, and if they're gonna survive in politics, it'll be as independents, at least for a little while. Um, that creates just a lot of room and a lot of unpredictability about who's gonna lead the party, who's gonna run even if we get you know, a contested leadership election um, in September, who exactly are the candidates are gonna be? It could be um, kind of a, a free-for-all when it comes to candidates entering the race, uh, when it comes to building the coalitions that candidates need to form to win, um, it's, in total, it's entirely up in the air about how exactly people are going to, you know, a winning candidate could assemble um, a, a winning coalition. I think the other practical consideration is what this means for Kishida. And he, of course, went into the scandal deeply unpopular, didn't really have uh, an ability to call on, on the public. Um, I think we can say at this point that he's missed an opportunity to really turn this scandal um, into to, you know, to his advantage to do what we might call a Koizumian turn, where he would appeal to the public and say, I'm going to be the reformer who smashes the factions. I'm going to turn this you know, into an opportunity to really change how the LDP works, how Japan's government works. I think that opportunity has been missed. You know, he, he looks very reactive, not in control of the situation. I think the perfect example is how he's been unable to convince Motegi and also to follow along the trend uh, in moving away from, from the factions. Um, and as a result, I mean, it's entirely likely that he might not even run for re-election. So not only uh, would he um, not, you know, not lose the race, but he just wouldn't run in the first place. And that would, of course, I think, feed the sense that the leadership election would be a free for all. Um, I'm mindful that I'm coming to the end of my eight minutes. Um, so I just want to uh, finish with just a, and there's my timer. Uh, I want to finish with just sort of a, a broader point um, about the significance of, of what we're seeing in Japan now. And I think, you know, that we've seen a lot of concern. Um, we talked about the year of elections, but there's also, you know, we're in a moment with a lot of concern about the viability of democracy around the world. You have concerns about the, the rise of a reactionary populism in the United States, but in lots of other countries. Um, and um, just generally, I think that the baleful influence of polarization in lots of democracies. Uh, but I think what we're seeing in Japan is actually, there's another threat to democracy and, and Japan is very much experiencing it. And that is, um, Democracy here is, I think, suffering from a sense of malaise, a sense of torpor, a sense of, you know, democracy is not working, but it's not even worth the effort to do anything. So compared to the early 90s, where political scandals resulted in the formation of new parties, the LDP splintered, there was a lot of energy around the idea of political reform. And we're not even seeing that now. There's no real comprehensive agenda for political reform. It's sort of these half measures, you know, the public's dissatisfied, but they're not there's no real calls for, for anything, maybe than some transparency or some accountability. Um, there's no charismatic challenge to, to Kishida within the LDP saying we've got to do it better. 
uh, the opposition parties are kind of going through the motions of criticizing, but not really doing anything. Um, and so, I mean, I, th I think that is really, uh, really shows just how deep the malaise is in Japanese politics, where you have this very serious scandal, uh, I think brazen uh, law breaking. Uh, this all began, of course, with a prosecutorial investigation. Um, and I wouldn't say that the Japanese public might not be yawning, but they're not also taking to the streets over this either. And, and so there's trouble, I think, in that sense. Great. Thanks, Tobias. That's 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 great. And um, I mean, I actually both presentations leave me a little depressed. So I'm hoping that that by the end of this uh, this session, that we'll have some more uplifting comments. But uh, um, let me just ask. Let's let, let me follow on up, Tobias, on a couple of points that you made and and the impact or the possible impact on policy. Uh, one is um, uh, if the what what are the chances that the LDP LDP itself could actually uh, lose power by the by the fall, and um, and and can you say a few words about the state of the opposition, which I I kind of guess is still pretty disorganized, um, and specifically how and, and if you can just follow up a little bit on why and maybe Akira you can comment on this as well why it is that you think that concentration of of, of power in um, the secretary general or the prime minister would, would be necessarily a bad thing for Japan. I, I will say as a former di US diplomat, we kind of liked the fact that the, uh, that the at least on the government side, that the Japanese uh, prime minister uh, you know, assumed oh. more leadership and more power <clears throat> and concentrated more in the Kante, the prime minister's office, as opposed to the bureaucrat, the, 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 the individual um, ministries. But um, if you can talk about some of those two and in, Akio, in I'd be interested in your comments on this as well. Um, well, so, so to the overall question, you know, how likely it is that we wouldn't see the LDP in government by the fall, I mean, I, I think very low, um, you know, in part because, I mean, Kishida is in a position where uh, he doesn't have to call an election, you know, you have uh, until uh, October 2025 before the, the Diet's four-year term ends, and, you know, clearly he's been in a situation where I think, um, He's not going to. He's not going to call an election at this moment, and I think you know the winds would have to change. I think considerably, um, and there'll be some uh, by elections in the spring that might be a useful indicator of just uh, how the party's situation stands. Um, but I mean, it it seems just as likely that if you have a change of party leader in the fall, uh, that maybe you have a new party leader use uh, a window of opportunity following a party leadership election to call a snap election and get a, a new mandate in that form. So, um, I you know I, I think I mean and maybe this is also just part of the this overall feeling of malaise that um, even with the scandal, even with this uh, sort of disappointment in, in how the LDP has conducted itself uh, for quite for quite a long time. I mean this is not you know this is not a, a scandal that. Uh, is referring to recent uh, decisions and recent behavior. I mean, this is behavior that's going back quite a, quite a while. Um, but I, I, I think there's still the sense that, uh, I, my guess is that if there were an election tomorrow, 50% uh, or more of the people would stay home. And, you know, the LDP, you know, it would look very similar to elections over the last decade. And as a result, you know, you'd have party supporters turn out. Um, Independence would stay home, be, be turned off, and the LDP could, uh, you know, maybe it loses some seats. Just you know, people who uh, are particularly vulnerable as a result of the scandals maybe lose their seats. But um, it's it's still hard to see the LDP losing power. I mean, some of that too. Um, you know, we've seen. You know, it looked like last year that there might have been a, a small Ishinokai bubble uh, that it might be able to break out from its stronghold in the Kansai region and maybe go national and really compete nationally. I think some of the struggles around the uh, Osaka uh, World's Fair next year, I think have taken some of the shine off of Ishin as a, a model of capable governance. I think some of the, just the old concerns about their ability to kind of extend their reach beyond Kansai remain. Um, the fact is, is that if they follow through on their plans to run candidates in lots, lots of different places, it's just as likely that you'd end up with um, Ishin and the Constitutional Democrats just dividing the opposition vote and the LDP winning uh, seats on the basis of a divided opposition vote. Um, that's been a factor over and over again for the last decade. Um, no reason to think that would be any different. And so- um, 
Before well, we get to the second question, actually, uh, I, I meant to ask you first, Tobias, could you just give us a, a, a 45 second uh, description of the financial scandal? Because I, I realize that there may be a lot of people on the call who actually are not familiar with what exactly happened. Yeah, so the, I mean, the, I mean the, the crux of it is, you know, the factions hold these um, fundraising parties where they sell tickets to supporters. Um, it's a major way of collecting um, funds that are then used to pay for campaigns, as we know, Japanese political campaigns are expensive, political campaigns everywhere tend to be expensive. Um, and basically what was happening was that, um, you know, party members had quotas of tickets they had to sell and essentially funds that they raised beyond the quotas were basically not reported. Um, and were then the faction basically collected these, uh, these funds and then kicked them back um, to members of the faction and, and did, you know, those uh, those transfers were not recorded. Um, you know, according to campaign finance law, they had to be reported, and um, and so you, you're just large. You know, I mean, in the scheme of things, you know, when you look at Japanese political scandals, the sums of money that that are involved always seem uh, fairly trivial, well, particularly spread over time. But it's more the the lawlessness in the sense of um, just you know doing you know sort of the free for all at at, at you know, the trough of, of campaign funds. Great, thanks for that. Um, actually, let me just to Dr. So what, what do you see as, as some of the, um, the implications for policy of, of this, um, of the financial scandal and the, um, and the instability within the LDP uh, for policy and policy making? You, you mentioned, for example, how the role of bureaucrats versus politicians, is that, is that something that's like, that could change as a result of this? Oh yes, um, yeah. This political scandal is a major blow to the Kishida administration. I think it's more difficult for Kishidas to survive uh, this year. But slim chance of the Kishidas come back is a calling election in around July after the diet. Uh, they hope uh, the economic situation is not so bad. And especially we have spring wage negotiation and uh, we see a more, another year of the big wage increase in this spring. And also tax break for the uh, personal income tax break will come in uh, this June. So probably if economic situation is much better than, uh, much better in summertime. Maybe Chile have chance to call election and not defeat, not lose. <laughs> because uh, as uh, Tobias mentioned, uh, the opposition party is so weak. Uh, so compared to the last time uh, the government changed in early 90s, and also uh, recent one is uh, 2009. The opposition party was so strong and uh, more energy. And uh, also Japanese people are very enthusiastic to the government change. But recently, uh, as Tobias mentioned, every stay home. So maybe LDP can survive if Kishida call action. But uh, I don't know if Kishida's uh maintain that election still uh, we have some competition in the september's uh ldp party election so maybe should uh, have another hurdle to clear but uh but uh, and also the centralization of the policy i think centralization of the policy making is not necessarily a bad thing and uh, many criticism for the abe administration stronger prime minister uh, kante uh, and um, bureaucratic is uh, more weak but uh, using power uh, leadership is uh, important so centralization of the power is not uh, necessary a bad thing for Japan. How to use it is more important. Uh, Tobias, you want to address that? I didn't give you a chance. Yeah, yeah, no, no. I mean, I mean, in some ways, um, and um, you know, I wrote about this in actually the, the updated version of my book. But that um, actually, I think maybe in the original as well. But the um, in, in some ways, you know, Abe's tenure 
was sort of the, the realization of several decades of centralizing reforms, you know, that he both was the beneficiary of those reforms and sort of pushed them forward. Um, and, and it's hard to see how much further it can go. And so I think the question, and, and I think, um, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, um, Fujisan, if this was uh, what you were suggesting, because I, I mean, I, I think, you know, there is this challenge now that you have, you know, essentially you've had um, informal constitutional change, right? You had Japan change from a mm. system much more bottom up, right. um, that was much more uh, cooperative, you know, even, you know, during LDP long, you know, LDP dominance during the Cold War, there was a lot of consultation um, with, you know, with opposition parties, you know, cooperation between LDP backbenchers and, and the bureaucracy. And yeah. so you've moved now to a system that is much more top down. The prime minister is much more capable of setting the agenda. What has not kept pace with that, I think, has been the development of uh, sort of countervailing forces in um, in Japanese politics and Japanese society that can that can hold that stronger government accountable. And so the you know the media, I think, has to develop the habits that enable it to keep um, power accountable. Um, in some ways, the, the diet's role almost has to evolve as well, where it is doing a little more to uh, monitor. And we saw this, I think, you know, in, in the UK as well, where you did have this centralizing process uh, that preceded Japan's centralizing process, where um, there was sort of more of a watchdog function in parliament. I mean, Japan and the diet has to start thinking of that as well. I mean, and also, I think, within the LDP, I mean, because the LDP as an institution is so um, important to how the country is governed, there needs to be some sense of um, holding leadership accountable. So if you're going to have these, these uh, the centralizing of power, um, there just needs to be more oversight. And I think a lot of the scandals we saw during the Abe years were about a problem of mm -hmm. oversight, where there just wasn't an ability uh, to monitor what it was doing. Um, you know, you had the, the Mori and Kake, Kake Gakuen scandals, and and you know where, where it was um, sort of the bureaucracy was was doing kind of its own thing and, and doing what it thought the prime minister wanted. And I mean, there just there needs to be more formal channels of, of monitoring the government. That in some ways is is a less exciting reform agenda than the centralizing uh, reforms were. I mean, you know, you know, back, you know, sort of in the transition from the Cold War to the post-Cold War and you know, all these reformers coming out saying, you know, the world's dangerous, we have to navigate it with stronger leadership. You know, that's something that I think you could get people excited about. Um, the kind of reforms that I think the moment requires are, are important, but maybe less exciting. I mean, there's not, you know, um, the, there's no, how do you have charismatic leadership in the name of transparency and accountability and watchdogs? I mean, it's sort of, um, it, it, you know, it's, there, there's not, there's not the same um, mobilizing force, I think, behind that, but I think it's really important. But that does go to the the point about the, the role that the prime minister does play in terms of uh, the two big areas that Akio pointed out in terms of risks, which is handling the U.S. relationship, and in this and, and the possibility that there may have to be a, a handling of the, another Trump administration, and exercising a, a a greater leadership role for Japan than we have seen in, over the last you know 50, 60 years. So in the last certainly fifteen to twenty years, or certainly since Abe came in. We've seen Japan play a much more robust uh, role of foreign policy, basically, in some ways, filling the vacuum of the United States and the Trump administration. Uh -huh. So the question I would have, I guess, is um, is uh, looking at the leadership in the LDP now, is there someone who could who could put, uh, who could step up and play that kind of role? Is it is it Prime Minister Kishida? Is it somebody else who could um, uh, play that role, and would he have the support of the party and the support of the people? I mean, how you know how committed are the people of Japan, public opinion, for this this more um, robust foreign policy, and how much how much of it was just simply driven by Abe's personality? Akira, you want to take a first stab at that, and I know that uh, Tobias has views on that as well. <laughs> yeah. Okay, uh, difficult question. I, I think uh, <clears throat> maybe nobody can. Uh, Nobody uh, can expect to take the uh, same similar role like uh, Shinzo Abe. Uh, I think he's a very, he's not so popular in domestic front, a uh, lot of political scandal, but in the uh, diplomatic front, I think many Japanese support his uh, greater uh, role in the Japan's diplomacy dealing with Trump or other international issue. 
And so, frankly speaking, we don't have uh, uh, such political leaders who can take the same role as Abe, but the potentially the Talo Kono, now digital finance minister, he is a very good, uh, he's a former uh, foreign minister and uh, he's a very good English speakers. And, um, but uh, the problem is he's a little bit weak in the domestic uh, uh, power uh, politics. And also uh, Motegi, uh, he's a former uh, foreign, also he's a former foreign minister. So uh, he's also skillful. He's a uh, negotiator with uh, USTL, uh, then Trump administration, USTL uh, ambassador Lighthizer. So, and then he also uh, knows uh, President Trump. So maybe uh, he can he can be a uh, good negotiator with the US. And uh, I don't know, Ishiba-san is also very popular in the domestic poll. And uh, he was a uh, former defense minister, but uh, we don't see uh, uh, big uh, activity in this diplomatic field so far. So that's it. Um, I, I, you know, I don't have, I don't have much to add in terms of names, but I mean, I, I think there's a broader point that I think is, is worth stressing. And that is uh, that I think, you know, Abe got, a, I think a lot of credit for his personal diplomacy with Trump, you know, starting, you know, immediately after the election, uh, and continuing um, for several years after that. But I, I think it's worth recalling that I think there were diminishing returns to that personal diplomacy as, as Trump felt more confident in power. Um, and, you know, I think you look at 2018 when Trump decided that he wanted to meet Kim Jong-un and, you know, Abe was calling, you know, kept trying to schedule calls and meetings and, you know, don't forget Japan, don't forget Japan. And it's not clear how much any of that mattered um, and I think, you know, the other example of the diminishing uh, returns from, from Abe's personal diplomacy to Trump was in 29 or 28, well, uh, again, I guess 2019 um, or 2018, 2019, where you had the threat of automobile tariffs, you know, to try to get Japan to negotiate a bilateral agreement that it didn't really want to negotiate. Um, you know, Abe, your Trump had no problem making that threat, um, you know, to put tariffs on all Japanese automobile uh, imports into the United States. Uh, until Japan came to the table, and there wasn't really much um, Abe could do to prevent that. And just given what we've heard about what a second Trump administration can be like, uh, I think we should be wary of the idea that if Japan just elects the right leader, um, it will be able to kind of head off some of the more um, dire Moshitora scenarios that that we've heard. You know that um, it it is. Not, it just seems it seems like it's gonna it's gonna take more than uh, just you know the right personal touch uh, this time around. I mean you know, that that I don't think that's going to be good enough. Yeah, good point. Let me uh, let me encourage uh, the audience now to to, uh, to ask questions and put start putting them in the chat. We have a couple already that are uh, in there. But 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 just before the we go to the chat questions, um, just um, just a follow up question for Akio on that on that last point that uh, yep. Tobias made, which is. Um, on the trade policy side, so um, uh, it's true that uh, the tr that the um, Trump administration was able to get Japan to the table. Not at the end of the day, it wasn't about autos. Of course, autos was at, at the end of the day was actually taken off, and the table was never actually negotiated. But they did negotiate the uh, the rest of the agreement that was that was part of the, the original TPP, the bilateral part of the TPP with the U.S. and Japan. Um, do you see a the the, the if if, the, if there's another Trump administration, would he? Is there a fear that he would be asking for more kinds of market opening, or is it, is the main fear just the ten percent uh, flat tariff that there that Trump is talking about for everybody? Yes, that's a big concern for Japan, and uh, obviously uh, we all. Uh, we still have a Japan U.S. bilateral uh, framework. Uh, then uh, published, uh, established by the, uh, at the time of the Trump era. So maybe probably we uh, repackage those uh, framework of the negotiation. So 
Uh, important thing is uh, how to defend uh, Trump attack is an unreasonable attack. So I think Prime Minister Abe is, uh, is very skillful at defending <laughs> those attacks and um, not so we had uh, some compromise uh, in US-Japan talks, but not big disaster for Japan. So how to manage Trump risk is very important for Japan's. Uh, so this bilateral talks, uh, how to how to manage those bilateral talks is very important for Japan. And also uh, asking US to not taking the unilateral <laughs> tariff place or those dangerous uh, policy, but it's a big question, big question. That, that's a good point. I, I, it's my understanding that the U.S.-Japan trade deal that was done uh, was actually did not go beyond what was negotiated uh, under the TPP that Wendy Cutler negotiated and Mike Perlman negotiated. So they, they, Japan didn't give up anything extra uh, as a result of that. And uh, um, But again, I guess the concern would be if would would a new would a new Trump administration kind of look for more? Or, um, okay, uh, let me uh, move to questions from the audience. Um, let's start with uh, you, Jenny uh, Shatsky. Um, I understand that you're on the phone, but not a without a video. But if you do, you, would you like to ask your question, you, Jenny? Sure. Thank you so much uh, for very informative discussion, which covers political, economic, diplomatic topics. Uh, since um, uh, I'm originally from Russia, but I lived in the States for more than uh, 20 years and uh, kind of curious about uh, uh, increasing cooperation among China, Russia, North Korea and Iran uh, and what kind of security risks it may create in the region. What we noticed with the current war in Ukraine and the conflict in the Middle East now uh, the U.S. as a probably main contributor from financial and military standpoint stretched too thin. And uh, in the Asia-Pacific region, it doesn't look like you have but a NATO alliance who could, who could step in and help in case of any risks of security threats. So w w what are the strategies, I guess, defense strategies and uh, corresponding budgeting strategies in Japan or other uh, allies of United States in the region to mitigate any potential risks if if worst case scenario can evolve. Maybe not, hopefully not in the short term, but again, you know, we probably need uh, to think about any potential kind of implications in the region if, if situation may cause any potential military risks besides political, economic, and other topics that you discussed. Thank you. Hope I was clear with my question. Okay, you want to start? Uh, that okay, so that's a question about uh, uh, national economic security issue in Asia, right? How to deal well, with? Well, in particular, what what happens if uh, China, Russia, North Korea, and Iran kind of get their act together and actually start um, pushing more aggressively? Um, uh, is yeah, in yeah, China that's it. Okay, axis of evil <laughs> scenario, exactly. right? Okay, yeah, it's very difficult but how to deal with that. So uh, Japan's uh, basic strategy is uh, cooperation among the uh, allies, especially US and South Korea, trilateral uh, uh, cooperation is very important. And then as you as you know that the Kishida administration already pledged uh, increase of the defense spending to the 2% of the GDP. And so huge increase of the defense uh, spending. And um, so cooperate uh, with cooperation with uh, uh, US and uh, Korea. That's uh, very important. And uh, also we need uh, dialogue with China, especially with China. With Russia, it's uh, very difficult to uh, start dialogue if it's this situation in Ukraine continues. But uh, the big question is how, if Trump was elected, 
Mushtora scenario, how Trump react to those uh, crises in Ukraine, uh, how to deal with Russia or China. That's very tricky uh, situation for Japan. But Japan uh, needs to build on strengths in the defense capability and also uh, strategic uh, uh, cooperation between other Asian countries, uh, not only Korea, more ASEAN countries, Philippines, Indonesia, Malaysia, or all those ASEAN-wide uh, cooperation. Liza, do you want to add anything better? Um, just, I mean, just quickly. Um, you know, I, I think it it shows the the potential vulnerabilities in in I guess what we call the Abe doctrine, which I think continues to guide Japanese foreign policy. And that is, I mean, the central pillar of it was um, that for the foreseeable future, Japan has no alternative but the you know U.S. engagement in the region. You know, commitment to Japan's defense, commitment to regional security. And that Japan had to do whatever it took to make sure that that, that continued, um, and that, of course, was you know at least partly a driver of of how Abe approached Trump. And it, I mean, I think we are uh, seeing that there are limits to that, both because maybe the, you know the U.S. is uh, whoever is in charge is less invested in the region, um, but also if it's just less capable because it's stretched thin by crises in other parts of the world. And, and that is, I think, a real concern. Um, it is not something that I think Japan has an easy answer for. It is not something that uh, can be filled by defense spending overnight. I mean, I think, you know, as we're seeing that this is, you know, it was clear that when the new national security strategy, the new def national defense strategy came out at the end of 2022, this was going to be a process that was going to take time. Um, we just saw the agreement about purchasing tomahawks, but, you know, like that's not it's not like okay, well now Japan has made the purchase and it has a deterrent of its own. I mean, this is this is clearly a a longer term process, and so uh, you know Japan is is certainly in a, a precarious situation where you know it is invested in the relationship with the United States, but um, if it can't count on that, um, there really are going to be questions of you know was what was announced at the end of 2022 enough. And you know, does Japan have to go you know, beyond what it's already said it was going to do? Um, and this is where the domestic political situation plays in. We're already seeing ways in which um, that is having consequences on the government's ability to follow through on what it said it was going to do at the end of 2022. For example, it was supposed to be uh, cybersecurity legislation uh, this spring. It looks like that is going to be kicked to the uh, sometime down the road. Um, yeah. Komodo has really dug into its heels as far as cooperation on arms export, which is key to developing, for example, um, a next generation fighter. Um, and you know, in those circumstances, um, Komodo has uh, every incentive uh, to listen to what its its supporters are saying and to not you know come to the table and to not be flexible. Um, you know, the stronger the LDP leader is, stronger the prime minister is, uh, the easier it is to bring Komodo around. And so there, there are consequences um, to kind of political uncertainty, political instability, um, and and that and you know the longer this situation continues, uh, the more we'll see those consequences play out. Great, and just for the the larger audience here, the Komeito, which is uh, an ally of the uh, LDP, is it does have because of its pacifist roots, has a bit uh, has doesn't support the kind of strong military and foreign policy as much as um, as the LDP itself. Um, uh, actually, that, 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 your last point there, Tobias, is a good segue to a question from uh, Marsha Vandenberg, who is concerned about all this talk about Moshi Tora and wants to talk about Moshi Biden instead. <laughs> uh, uh, Marsha, you want to ask your question? Thank you. Thank you, Larry. I actually have a second question, uh, but the first is if the uh, two speakers could comment uh, briefly, given the time, on the outlook for the relationship in the event Biden is reelected to a second term. But my second question as well is, given the political uncertainty in Japan, what is the outlook for the progress that's been made in the Japan North or South Korea relationship? Thanks. Uh, Akio, you want to take that first? Okay. Okay. So, uh, so if Biden, Moshi Biden <laughs> scenario. So, 
Uh, I think Biden's second term, I think the Japanese uh, foreign uh, official, foreign policy uh, official will be relieved if Biden's uh, re-elected. But I think uh, there is uh, some concern in the, I, I know that the many Americans concern his age and uh, how the second term look like. He still have energy to run another four years. And also, uh, I have some concern that, uh, as I mentioned, that uh, Biden is also not free uh, trader. Uh, I mean, uh, I think also Democrat. Uh, recently, Biden get a, a, a support from the UAW. So, uh, in this campaign, Biden's uh, has more heavily rely on the uh, labor union. So that means more uh, protectional, protectionist tendency uh, uh, will rise in the second term. And uh, I understand the younger generation uh, in uh, Democrat, Democrat Party is not so favor uh, uh, Biden. So I think uh, there is some concern that that the second Biden election is going to more uh, uh, old type protectionist policy uh, style, but but uh, compared to the Trump, uh, I think we have more predictability, so uh, uh, we don't have any big problem. Uh, only age issue and. Uh, who will be the uh, next president. So maybe if Biden was elected, we are looking at more 2020 election, who will be the next leader. And uh, South Korea, relationship with South Korea, um, as I mentioned in the uh, earlier remarks that uh, we are uh, looking at the uh, uh, Korean parliament election in April is a very key, uh, uh, key uh, political uh, event. And uh, if uh, President Yoon keep his power, maybe he's determined to improve the relation with, with Japan. And then also Japan's politicians welcome the Yoon's uh, policy stance. At least government level, uh, Japan-Korea relationship is uh, improving in this administration in, in Yun's administration, but the uh, opposition party in Korea is uh, more anti-Japan. And so maybe the change of the government of the uh, Korea, maybe the change of the tone towards Japan. So uh, we are not uh, so optimistic in the longer uh, relationship with Korea, if government change, maybe the reversal of the, or the policy, uh, pro Japan policy was reversed. So that's uh, some risk ahead. And just to, and to, to clarify for the audience, uh, the legislative elections, of course, wouldn't replace Yoon, but it would, it would certainly uh, make it very difficult for him to do uh, more with the Japan if he no longer has the majority in the uh, in, in in the legislature. That's uh, I think part of the, the challenge that the, he would face. And one of the questions I have is whether they could actually walk things back from what have, has already been agreed. But we can maybe we can get that. Tobias, why don't you go ahead and uh, answer the, address those two questions as well? The um, uh, Moshi Biden and uh, and anything that you have to say about Korea? Yeah. Um, so on the the. Moshi Biden's question, um, you know, I, I think, you know, in terms of the broader approach to the alliance, I mean, clearly, you know, this is a administration that has put U.S. alliances at the center of its foreign policy that's certainly likely to continue. Um, you know, I don't think you have to worry about uh, you know, NATO withdrawal or the end of, you know, U.S. alliances in Asia. I mean, all of that. I mean, I, you know, I think there's a, there's a baseline level of, of predictability, I think, that comes with that. Um, the thing that I Kind of caution when you know when, you know I'm here in Japan and having conversations and talking about U.S. politics. I mean, I think the thing that maybe Japan and other U.S. allies need to be worried about is less even policies and more that we're only 
we're, we're still not at the, the end of the beginning as far as um, the consequences of political polarization, political instability in the US. I mean, even a Biden victory, um, you know, what does the aftermath of that election look like? Um, what sort of, you know, do we see what we saw in 2020 where people were sort of, you know, trying to intimidate, you know, vote counters and, you know, what, what is, you know, what are the months, the weeks and months after the US presidential election look like? Um, and what are the years look like? I mean, uh, you know, I'm sitting here, you know, sitting here in Tokyo, seeing the news out of Texas and, and the standoff between the federal government and the, the government of Texas. I mean, you know, whether Trump or Biden, uh, these kinds of episodes seem unlikely to stop. And um, that, I think, is something that every U.S. ally is going to have to live with. Um, and what does that mean for the ability of, in the event, for example, of a North Korean contingency or a Taiwan contingency, you know, for a U.S. government to make a, a commitment um, that could cost American lives, American treasure, in, you know, on defense, you know, in the defense of uh, a treaty ally in the event of, you know, in the case of South Korea or a country in which, you know, the U.S. has signaled it would uh, come to the defense of if necessary, uh, you know, if the circumstances are appropriate uh, in the case of Taiwan, that, you know, that political environment in the United States, as that continues, I mean, I, I, every, every ally has to be wondering. And, you know, I will never forget the editorial that the Yomiuri Shinbun published on, you know, it was January 7th or January 8th about the events of January 6, 2021, um, you know, and, and talking about what a, a travesty this was for, you know, you know, American democracy and, and what it means for the world. And um, we're not, you know, I don't think we've seen the last of that. And so that is, I think, something that you know, whoever wins, um, you know, Japan is going to have to live with and, and, and navigate around. Sorry to be so pessimistic, but it's... it's yeah, I, I wanted to end on a really high point here, Tobias, but uh, <laughs> actually, we have time only for one more question. Actually, we're a little bit over, but let me, since uh, the, the questions from our president, I can't uh, I, I can't say no to him. So uh, Steve Pollack, I think, had a question. I think this one's for uh, Akio. It has to do with exchange rates. <laughs> Go ahead, Steve. Well, my, uh, just a question about, uh, you know, the the exchange rate has, you know, the yen has become much weaker over, you know, the last year or so. And I want to know what your projection is about uh, exchange rates going forward, as well as the impact on both uh, Japanese consumers and, and companies. And if you could tell us about st the stock exchange as well, that'd be great, because we, we, we like to make the bets <laughs> based on your recommendations. <laughs> okay, so should I, should I answer? <laughs> so, uh, so, Optimist, optimistic. I, I will be optimistic. So maybe Nikkei average may purse forty thousand. <laughs> so sometime in this year, I hope free, but uh, I don't know. I can't predict market, but uh, many optimism in actually not in Japan, but uh, from the foreign investors. Uh, there is a, probably we have. Third, we have seen third way of the foreign purchase in the Japanese security market in the century. First is uh, Koizumi Junichiro uh, took office in early 2000, uh, very optimistic change of Japan and then foreign investors uh, coming to Japan's market, but it's failed. And then 2013, Abe, Abenomics, at the time, and then for the investors rushing to buy uh, uh, Japan's equities. And this time, uh, Kishida is not so <laughs> decisive uh, reform, but uh, we have some corporate reform led by uh, Tokyo Stake, Stock Exchange. Also geopolitical change, uh, more geopolitical importance of Japan as an uh, investment of uh, semiconductor of the subtract chains. Also, and also Warren Buffett uh, purchase of the Japanese stocks, that kind of those events are uh, pushing uh, foreign investors uh, uh, optimistic view of Japan. So, and then now uh, Japanese individual uh, seems to change a little bit, but still they're still uh, buying foreign stocks. So an uh, important uh, key uh, <clears throat> issue is uh, how Japanese household react to this change of the uh, Japanese economy. Uh, we are 
coming. Finally, we are getting out from the long-term deflation and uh, we have wage increase, but still Japanese household is very conservative. So uh, the key is uh, how this household, Japanese household will move. And then, uh, so yen's uh, exchange rate is also related to this. If house, a Japanese household buying the U.S. stocks continue to buy U.S. stocks, maybe Japanese yens will not uh, uh, coming back and uh, stay around this level or much weaker. Uh, but uh, if Japanese households uh, going back to the Japanese market and then also more foreign investors coming back to Japan, maybe yens may be going up again. So, but I can't predict. Well, we can talk about <laughs> I can't it. predict the market. <laughs> yeah. uh, Tobias, anything to say? But I, I noticed that, uh, that uh, Akio linked a lot of his stock market movements to prime ministers. And, uh, and you had mentioned that uh, Kishida's... Uh, He's probably more hoping than than trying to uh, hoping for good economic news this year to, as a way to stay in power. But go ahead. Yeah, well, I mean, just seeing, I mean, just you know, quickly, just watching wage negotiations and household incomes. I mean, that is just sort of the that's been the annual exercise ever since economics began, right? That are, you know, is there a way to really put more money in, in people's pockets and, and to feel that their uh, their real incomes are growing? And I mean, that you know, a lot is going to depend on that. So. Um, uh, you know, I, I'm mindful of times. So I'm not going to go to. I mean, I I agree with uh, with what Akio said. Great. Well, we've run out of time, I'm afraid, but uh, we'll have to close the uh, the formal uh, presentation here. But we will have, uh, be after we uh, close and stop recording. We'll, we will have a few minutes to uh, keep on talking, and uh, so we. I see where there's a couple questions here that we can still address at that point. But let me turn it over to, uh, but first, let me thank uh, Akio and Tobias for a fantastic discussion. It was really enlightening. I learned a lot. Um, I hope the audience did as well. And uh, again, we look forward to, to seeing you again at uh, Japan Society's programs. Let me turn it over to Steve for a, a closing statement. Steve. Well, thank you, Larry. Thank you, Akio. And thank you, Tobias, uh, for a great program. Um, you know, as, as most people know, this is one of our uh, very popular programs each year, an outlook on, you know, the Japanese econ economy and political scene going into 2024. And, you know, because we did record it, we can go back 12 months from now and, and check to see how you did with your uh, projections. We have the estimate of the, the stock market level from uh, from <laughs> Fujisan. So we've got that recorded. Uh, but anyway, thank you, everybody, for uh, joining our program today. Um, we really appreciate your participation. Building bridges between the United States and Japan since 1905. Japan Society.